Have you ever wanted to make your own tower defense game? If so, then today is your lucky day. Follow along with me as I teach you how to do it. My name is Devin, and this channel is for gamers who are learning how to code. In this video, we're building a mod for Age of Empires 4. Let's get into it. First, I'm going to open up the Age of Empires 4 content editor. I'll click create a new mod, and I've already gone over these options in a separate video, so I won't go through them again today. But I'm going to start with a crafted map and afterwards add a tuning pack to that crafted map. And the crafted map I start with will be blank. So it will be quite similar to a game mode where it has its own win conditions. You don't destroy the enemy base to win and you don't build an entire civilization. You're just constructing towers to destroy the creeps. So let's pick crafted map next. I'm going to call my mode Siege of Empires. Now I'm a big fan of this terrain layout tool. It's a great way to get started in a map because it allows you to draw at a very high level what you want the map to look like. I won't use it in this case because it's not granular enough for what I want for this map, but I suggest you try it out. It probably will be a good fit for your map. Let me just show it to you real quick. If I pick terrain layout and hit next, I can essentially pick a tile from the palette. In this case, it says hills low rolling, and then I can draw at a high level what I want the terrain of my map to look like. So in this example, I want a small area in the middle where you can place your units. And then I want a pathway that the monsters walk down and around your tower and away so that you have time to kill the creeps. So this will be the basic look of our map, but the reason I'm not going to use it is the smallest size it allows is micro, and that would require me to scroll the camera as I'm playing the game back and forth in order to see the creep spawning, unless I just ignored the majority of the map and only used the very center. And in addition, each of these tiles is quite large, so it'll create a walking path much bigger than I need. For that reason, I'm going to just draw the terrain completely from scratch. But one nice thing about this, once I click next, is for a typical map, it works well because it will also generate resources like stone, gold, trees, berries, and it will randomize the slope of the terrain to feel natural. So I'll just click next so you can see what the generator produces based on my drawing. This is how it turned out, and you can see it roughly matches my sketch. If there were a way to shrink this to a smaller size, I would use this tool for my tower defense, but I could not find a way to make it work. There are tools under scenario resize and under generators scale world, but neither of them quite worked how I wanted. And the only other option I could have come up with is zooming the camera out really far, but that requires some extra steps. I first would have to right click terrain to add, which creates a camera mesh. And then I would have to modify the mesh to allow the camera to zoom out further. But then by zooming out, even though the landscape would look correct, all of the 3D models for trees and units and buildings would be much too small and I would need to scale them larger. So this is just not a good option since I really want a tiny map. So let's quit out of this and instead do a blank map from scratch. File, close mod, don't save, file, new mod. Okay, crafted map, next, siege of empires, and instead I'll do from scratch, not the terrain layout tool. I'm gonna click advanced. This will allow me to set a different size for my map. For terrain size, I'll pick 128, and for playable area, I'll pick 96. The playable area is smaller so that the camera can show terrain on the outskirts of the map without the player being able to move their units to those edges just for visual appeal so you don't feel like the world is flat and ends abruptly. I'm going to leave it at two starting positions because the editor will refuse to compile my map if I don't have at least two. However, for now, I'm just making it a single player game. 
I'll deal with multiplayer in a future version. So the second starting position will just be ignored. I'll explain the chunk size in just a second, but I would suggest leaving it at the default of 16. Click OK, Next. And under Mod Description, this is what the community will see when they look at your mod before downloading it. So you want to describe your mod well enough that they know if they're interested in trying it out. I'll be lazy for now and just say tower defense game. But when I'm all finished, I'll update this with a better description. Click finish and you'll see I have a completely blank slate. Now, something I should have shown previously with the generated map is if you go to scenario, switch camera, and instead of tool camera, which allows you to zoom in and out as much as you want, if you switch to game camera, it will zoom into what the player will see. And so in this instance, you can tell that when I'm fully zoomed out, if I scroll, I very quickly get to the edge of the screen. And that's exactly what I want so that the player essentially does not need to scroll. They just always see the entire map while they're playing. You can still zoom in with this mode, but only as much as the real game would allow you to zoom. That's useful for testing without loading the full game, but I'll stick with the tool camera for now. I mentioned chunks earlier. If you go to scenario, display chunks, a green grid will show up on the map. This is useful when you're drawing terrain yourself to make sure you have straight lines. And because I chose the size of 16, which was the default, if I pull up a calculator, my map size was 128, but my chunk size is 16. If I divide that, I get eight chunks. And my map is a square, so it's the same on either axis. Because I have eight chunks, if I count these green squares, I have eight on either direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These other grid lines are just for convenience. If you want to line up your train within a chunk and keep your drawing straight. So if I want to find the center of my map, visually just guessing, it would be hard to know. But if I just count my chunks, one, two, three, four, this is the center. And then again, one, two, three, four, this is the center. So let's draw this. I'm going to expand terrain and then expand tiles. And right now I only have one tile. I need to import the tiles I want to use. So I'll right click and say add. And then on the right side under properties, there's a blueprint. I'll click the three dots, which gives me a pop-up where I can select a tile. I'll type grass in the search window. And I don't know that I necessarily care which grass I choose. So I'll just pick one at random. Let's do tall, lush, taiga. Okay, on the right side, after I pick my blueprint, I can see a preview. But next I want to actually paint it. I'm going to hide this properties tab just so I can see the render view better. I'll keep this paint tab open. The painting tools have a left and a right brush. The purpose here is if I left click, it can do one operation. And if I right click, it can do a different one. I have to pick my options first, but I can make my left click be grass and my right click be water. That just makes it easier to paint quickly without switching back and forth between different tools. But to avoid that complexity, I'll just stick with the left click for now. I want to select this paintbrush, not the eraser, and I'll put the size as high as it'll go. I'll change the tile to my grass, and then I'll zoom out so I can see my map better. And I'll just left click and paint. You'll see that it very quickly paints the entire map because the size of my brush is so large. Okay, there's my grass. Now, if I wanted it to feel very realistic, I'd want to mix multiple types of grass and add slopes to the train, but I'm not an artist and I don't think it's necessary here. Next, I'm going to add a separate tile, right click, add, and then on this blank tile, I'll go to properties and choose a different blueprint. This time I want some type of road. So let's search for cobble which is kind of like a stone path. Again, I'm not sure it matters too much which one I pick. Let's just go with English age two. Now back to my painter window, I'll switch from grass to cobblestone and I'll switch from a circle to a square and I'll 
change the size much smaller. I think maybe size four is good. And I'll leave the center four squares as the location for your tower. So I'm going to draw the path around it for the creeps to walk. And I'm going to try to match the chunk line as close as possible. You can also go into scenario overlay and add a grid or grid lines if you don't want to use the chunk lines, but it's a similar result. Okay, let's keep drawing. It's not going to be 100% accurate since I'm not snapping to the grid lines. I'm just doing it visually, but I think it will be close enough. So I'll keep going until I've drawn a box around the entire center square. And this will be the path that my creeps walk along. And then I'll also add an indicator afterwards where the start and end of the path will be to indicate the spawn point as well as the ending point where you lose a life if you have not killed the creep by that point of the path. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. So I'm imagining the creeps will spawn here on the left. They'll walk straight across. And at that point, your towers will most likely not be doing any damage unless they have extremely long range. That's just to give the suspense of seeing the monsters coming and also to give you time to make any adjustments before the battle starts. Once they get to about this corner, your tower should start attacking. They'll walk all the way around your tower and then afterwards walk up and when they get to the edge of the map at the top is when they will despawn and you'll lose a life. The rest of the outskirts of the map, I'll add neutral objects that you can interact with for upgrades, reading instructions, etc. And actually, my plan is to only have one tower in the middle, which you won't choose to construct. It will always be there. You'll actually recruit units and there will be synergies between the units and for them to attack you garrison them inside of your tower so we'll see how it works before i do anything else you always want to save frequently in case the editor crashes so you don't lose your progress so i'm going to hit file save and in addition i recommend you use github.com to upload your code so that you can keep track of changes and you always have a backup you can fall back to in case you make a mistake and need to recover to a previous baseline you're happy with. For example, if I click here on commits, you can see each individual change I've made to each file along the way. For example, here I had a typo. I misspelled the word siege. And so I corrected that because I have a history. If I made a mistake, I could go back to the previous version to interact with GitHub. I recommend installing a tool called Git Extensions. What it does is if I right click on a folder, it has all of these options that connect to GitHub. And the most frequent one you'll use instead of in the submenu, it's right above called Commit. So if I click Commit now, it shows I have no changes. But if I go back to the editor and I draw some random cobblestone and save, if I refresh the commit window, it shows the specific files that were changed. And if they're binary files, it won't show you the actual changes themselves. But for text files, it will show you the actual changes. Then if you click this purple arrow down, the bottom area is called the staging area. These are the files you want to upload to GitHub. So if I wanted to exclude a specific file, and leave it at the top, I can do that. Files at the top remain intact on your hard drive so you don't lose the changes, but they're not uploaded to GitHub. So if you ever reverted to an old backup in the future, those changes would be lost since they're not uploaded. That's useful if you're experimenting with something and you want to quickly revert back. You can do so and choose not to upload because you know they're experimental changes. Finally, I would type some kind of message here. This is just a note to myself. So when I'm reading the history later, I know what changes are contained here. So I would type something like drawing a random cobblestone in an S shape, something like that. And then you would type commit and push. Commit by itself only 
saves to your local Git repository. A Git repository is kind of like a database of code, but because it's only local, if your hard drive crashes, you would lose it. But it is still a full history that you can revert back to previous changes if needed. I recommend always doing commit and push. The push actually uploads the changes to GitHub so that even if your hard drive crashes, it's available online. And by default, it's also being published to the world as open source. Anyone else can see your code if they want to, but you can change it to be private if you choose. After I've published my changes, if I wanted to review the history, I could right click, get extensions, view changes, and this shows me each separate publish that I did. And when I select it, it shows me which files were modified as well as what specific changes were made to that file. So if I wanted to revert back to an old version, I could right click on that version and say reset back to here. This is not a Git tutorial. It gets much more complicated than this. I can't explain it all in this video, but I recommend you start using this tool and learning it for all of your coding projects. Since I don't want to keep this ugly path I drew, I'm going to say file close mod. But remember my changes were saved. I'm only closing because I want to revert the files, but the editor will crash if I revert the files while they're open. Because they're saved and I have not yet committed, I can right click and say commit. All of my changes show here. I'm going to unstage all of them. Then I'll highlight all of them and right click and say reset. Now I have no changes at all. So I can close this window and reopen my mod and it's back to how it was originally. Okay, back to our map. There's some changes I want to make in the scenario editor before we get too much further. First, under players, I want to expand that and choose player two. And then in the properties tab, I want to change the status to closed. That way it's always a single player game. Next, under scenario, I want to open the properties window and I want to scroll down to the win condition and change it from default to none. The default, allows them to win by collecting enough holy landmarks or relics or destroying the enemy's buildings. There are multiple ways to win. I want none because I'm going to use a custom script to determine when they've won. I don't want the game to automatically calculate that. And next under options for win conditions, I'll click edit. And this just determines the defaults. The player can still change this in the game lobby before they start but I want to override the default map state and instead of concealed, I want revealed. That essentially gets rid of the fog of war. Now I could do that in a Lua script instead of selecting it here. By choosing it here, it only defaults the game lobby. The player can still override it. I'm not doing it in the Lua out of laziness. I'll do other things in Lua later, but if they choose to modify this, that's their own choice. I think it would make the game less enjoyable because there's no purpose to fog of war for my map, but I won't prevent the player if they want to do that. Okay. Next under object browser, I want to drag in an outpost into the center of the map, which will do the actual attacking. The object browser has a list of templates. Each of these folders is a different type of template. Outposts are going to be within E, BPS, which stands for Entity Blueprint. Units like Villagers would be under SBPS, which stands for Squad Blueprint. Squads also have an entity underneath, but the squad has additional code related to their movement, their formations, their combat AI, etc. Since buildings don't have any of that, they're just considered entities. If I search for outposts, you'll see a whole bunch of them. This is because each civilization has their own blueprint because their attributes may be slightly different. One may have more health, one may do more damage, one might cost more resources to build, etc. In this case, I don't necessarily care which civilization's outpost I use because it's just for visual purposes and to allow the units to garrison. So I'll just pick one at random and drag it in. Now it shows these arrows, which allows me to drag it on the screen in either axis. Or if I 
move my cursor over the pink square, it changes to yellow and I can drag it from there in both axes. I want my outpost to be kind of towards the corner here because the rest of the grass area, I want the player to use for organizing their units before they garrison. I might change that later, but we'll see how it works. And then these green spots are the player start positions. For player one, I'm gonna drag it into the center. For player two, since it's essentially disabled anyways, it does not matter. I can't delete it or else the editor won't allow me to compile the map, but I'll just drag it out of the way since I know it's not useful. However, the type of starting position it selects by default is called shared territory. That essentially gives them a town hall with a bunch of villagers, a few herdable sheep, and a scout. I don't want any of that. So I have two options. I can either in the templates search for a different starting position. And the one I want is called no town center. I can drag that in and then change its owner to player one. Or I can simply take the player one shared territory entity and click the three dots next to its blueprint and change it to the no town center version. It's essentially the same thing. In one case, I'm deleting and adding a new one. In the other case, I'm just editing the existing. Okay, let's remember to save frequently. And now I wanna start working on the actual units that will garrison inside this outpost. In order to do that, I need to create a tuning pack. And I want my tuning pack to be part of the map itself so that they're bundled together. I don't want the players to have to download two separate mods. To edit the unit attributes, you go into attributes, open attributes. Notice right now this menu has hardly any options. After you click open, you'll see that the content editor looks like it's loading a second instance of the program. That's not the case, it's just loading another module into the existing program. But when it loads, then the attributes menu has a ton more choices. And these are all categories of data that you're able to modify inside of a tuning pack. I mentioned earlier that EBPS stands for Entity Blueprints, where one example would be an outpost, which is a building, and also SBPS for squads, where one example would be a unit like a villager. So if I click EBPS, a new tab opens with a tree structure where I can edit all of the data. So first I need to go back to my render screen and select my outpost and look at the properties to figure out which type of outpost I actually added. I can also expand my scenario window to see it as well. The blueprint I chose has underscore ABB. That's the Abbasid civilization. So when I go into the EBPS editor, I need to expand races and make sure I'm editing that specific civilization. Otherwise my changes won't take effect. Now the player can actually choose any civilization they want because I've specifically dragged in this exact building any player can have control of it since even if the player chooses a different civilization, they will still control this tower and it will still be the Abbasid civilization since I hard coded it in the editor. But if they went to construct a new outpost with a villager, it would be whatever civilization the player had. So in this case, I want to find that exact outpost and edit it. In my tower defense, I actually want the player to be able to control all the different civilizations and recruit units from each of them. So they might have an English villager and a Chinese villager working together in the same colony that's defending against the creeps. But I'll get to that later when I design the actual units. So in order to modify this outpost, I want to right click and say clone because you can't edit the data directly. You have to modify a copy of it and that copy will override the base. Unfortunately, it's disabled, and that's because I have not converted my map to include a tuning pack. So I'll go to File, Run Asset Wizard, and then choose Attribute Mod, which is the same thing as a tuning pack, and click Next. Now, this is not creating a brand new mod, this is adding a tuning pack to my existing mod, so they will be a bundle, and they will 
download together. The player unfortunately can still choose to play the map by itself without the tuning pack or take this tuning pack and use it with any random map. They're not going to like that experience because I have not designed this map or tuning pack to work separately, but the game does allow them to do that if they want to experiment. For my attribute mod name, I'll just call it the same as the map itself, Siege of Empires. Now, before I click finish, this is very, very important. Do not mess this up. The default radio button is the top option. This option does not work at all. Do not ever choose it. Always choose the second one, which is replace base game data with new data. Only one tuning pack can be active at a time. I don't know why this top option exists. I'm guessing either it's buggy or unfinished. I think the intent was to actually embed the tuning pack in the map itself so that the player cannot separate the two and it's completely automatic. But unfortunately, it just does not work at all. None of your changes will take effect if you choose that option. None of your custom units will be loaded. So always choose the second option. I'll click finish. And now I mentioned that because the two are separate but bundled together, the player could choose to play the map without the tuning pack or enable the tuning pack on a different map. We want to prevent that from happening on accident. So I'm going to tell the map to default to always select this tuning pack. To do that, I say edit, copy, mod, GUID. Then I click my scenario and go to properties and scroll down to tuning pack, mod, GUID and paste it in. Now it will automatically select this tuning pack whenever this map is played. Now that my map has a bundled tuning pack, I can go back to my outpost in the attribute editor, right click and say clone. Don't modify any of these default options. It's a more advanced scenario that I'm not going to explain right now, but basically you want the top two checked and the bottom one unchecked. Essentially that means copy all of the values so that I can edit them. Do not inherit any of the values directly. The reason you might want to inherit instead of copy is, for example, every civilization has an outpost, but there's also a civilization called core that all of the civilizations inherit from. This gives a basic outpost before any civilization specific modifications. So if I wanted to create a brand new unit that had a different version for all 10 civilizations, then I might make a core unit which clones and copies. And then for each of the race specific units, I would clone but inherit instead of copy. And that way I can change the core unit at any time and it will automatically propagate down to each of the civilizations unless it has been specifically overridden. Without the inheritance, because the values are copied, if I later change my mind about a specific value, I would need to go into each of the races and change it. I can't just change it from the core. That's a useful feature, but it's too advanced for what we're doing right now. So now that I've cloned the outpost, I have a new folder with my mod name that has my own version of the outpost. On the right side, it shows all of the properties of this entity and they're in a key value format. So the left is the property name and the right is the value. If I right click, expand all, I can see all of the attributes. For now, I just want to make sure my tuning pack is working correctly. So I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom and under UI extra info, I'm gonna change this description. Instead of explaining the real rules of the game, I'm going to change it to explain my tower defense rules. So I'll say something like garrison your units to attack the creeps which spawn each wave. This will appear when the player in game clicks on the outpost and mouses over the tooltip. So I want the game to be self-explanatory and scatter the instructions throughout the game. And I'll try to make this outpost kind of the main place where all of the instructions are located. So later on, I'll modify these abilities at the top and give each of them custom 
icons and tooltips to explain various rules of the game. So the player has one place where they can get all the information they need. But that should be good for now. Let's just drag in a random villager from Guad. Doesn't really matter which race I pick, just to prove that the civilizations can be different within the same player. I'll choose French this time and grab my villager. I'm not going to keep this in the final game. I'll just use it for testing and I'll change the owner to player one. I think we're at a good point where we wanna just test the map, make sure the changes we've made so far are what we wanted before we continue the rest of the map development. So I'll do file, save, and then build, build mod. It takes a minute to compile the mod and you cannot do this if the game is actually running. So make sure you quit out of the game first because otherwise the files will be locked and you'll get an error. It's done compiling, so I'll click OK and I'll load the game. OK, the game's loaded. If I go to mods, my mods, you can see my mod is here as well as other mods which I have created and published. It will default to enabled, so I'm able to play it. Let's go back to play skirmish and for map, I will change to a crafted map and choose Siege of Empires. If I click back to map setup and then game mode, you'll see that the map state defaulted to revealed because we told it to do that, but I can still override it. I hope the player chooses not to, but that's their choice. And then under tuning pack, there is a tuning pack with the exact same name as my map and it has been pre-selected. Now I could ruin my experience if I instead switched it to a different maps tuning pack. This is a different mod I created and the tuning pack is not going to be useful for this map. So again, I hope the player leaves that setting alone. And then finally, because I closed player two, you can see I'm in a single player game. I have no ability to add any AI or other players. So let's go ahead and click start. And here's my map so far. I think it's turning out pretty good. So I have my villager and my outpost. And just to prove that the tuning pack is working, if I select the outpost and mouse over, you'll see the bottom of the tooltip says, garrison your units to attack the creeps which spawn each wave. Now, there are other parts of the tooltip which I need to change because it talks about fortifications and weaponry and line of sight, which are not relevant to my map. So I'll change that later. There's really not anything else to test here. I just wanted to make sure that what I'd changed so far was working. But anyways, I think that's a good stopping point for now. The things I've left remaining, I'm going to do in a part two video. And hopefully by the end of part two, we'll have a fully working map for a tower defense game. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions and I'll see you in the next one.